Hello, everybody, and welcome back to video number two on chapter one. And when we left off, we were looking at the financial accounting standards boards. And here are the types of pronouncements they make. First, here we have um, our accounting standards update, and it shows a nice little picture of what that looks like. And then here, the financial accounting concepts we have the statement of financial accounting concepts with a number associated with it. And those describe the pronouncements that the board uh, generates. All right, let's take a look at this question. I'll give you a second or two to read it. The first step taken in the establishment of a typical FASB statement is, And of course, the correct answer is Delta here. Topics are identified and placed on the board's agenda. All right, FASB codification, how is it documented? Well, pro it provides all the authoritative literature related to a given topic. And it's, it simplifies users' access to all those authoritative, generally accepted accounting principles. So it establishes the way that our principles are documented, presented, and updated. And it'll, it strives to eliminate non-essential information. Okay, so let's look at an illustration. Here we have our topic. And it's a collection of related guidance on a given topic, in this case, receivables. And then there's subtopics, debt restructuring by creditors, overall, um, how we measure it uh, initially and then subsequently, and then loans and trade receivables not held for sale. So you can read on this yourself and get a good feeling for this codification framework. All right, so <clears throat> if we discuss the financial reporting organizations a little bit more, here we went through the FASB, the American Institute of Public uh, Accountants, generally accepted accounting principles, the SEC, uh, the International Accounting Standards Board, public and private partnerships, how we codify it, and then the statement of those concepts. And here, we're going to look at this in a little more depth. And here is the, um, I'll let you read these on your own, but here the idea is to try to match these descriptions with those organizations. All right, now we'll take a look at describing the components and usefulness of the conceptual framework. Now, the basic objective of financial reporting is that conceptual framework. So think about the types of decisions that these investors are making about companies. They need to decide if they want to buy their stock, sell, sell their stock, or hold their stock in a company. Lenders decide whether to lend money to a company and for what interest rate and for how long. Very important to us as a company. A bank is a key partner. All right, so let's look at these qualities of accounting here. Here's our basic objective. A constraint, of course, is cost. And decision usefulness, naturally, is something that is a criteria that we all want to uh, embrace. And now, they need to be relevant. These qualities of, the, of, of our information needs to be relevant and be accurately or faithfully represented. Okay, then we have ingredients of fundamental qualities, a little bit academic there. We have predictive value, conformatory value, materiality, completeness, neutrality, and error free. And then Based on this relevance and faithful representation, we want it to be comparable to other companies. We want a standards so that we can compare um, 
let's say Nike with Under Armour and have have them be the, the, the numbers that you see in their financials be comparable. And we want them to be verified, verified and accurate and understandable and generated on a timely basis. Okay, we'll go through each one of these a little bit. Relevance is one of the two fundamental qualities that make information useful. So here's our relevance, and we want them to have predictive value, conformatory value, and be, and be material. That's not raw material, that's a cost constraint, materiality. Okay, what is predictive value? That's information that helps predict if the has predictive value if it helps users form their own expectations, usually about the future. The conformatory value has value if it helps the users confirm or correct their prior expectations. And then materiality is a company specific aspect of relevance. All right, let's take a look at an illustration. Here, we're assessing the materiality of one of the more challenging aspects of accounting because it requires evaluating both relative size and importance. So for example, let's consider two sets of numbers here. Here we have sales. Here we have 10 million. Here we have 100,000. Cost and expenses, 9 million. 90,000. Income from operations, therefore, are a million dollars and ten thousand dollars. Now, an unusual gain of twenty thousand dollars compared to a million dollars is way different than an unusual gain of five thousand compared to income from operations of ten thousand. So let's take a look at that. During a period in question, the revenue and expenses and therefore the incomes from operations of the company A and B are proportional, meaning for both companies, income from operations is 10% of sales. Each reported an unusual gain, but these amounts have very different effects for each company. The gain for company A here is only 2%. 20,000 is a percentage of a million. And that would not really seriously distort that if we reported 980,000 versus, or a million, 20,000 versus a million. But for company B, that gain of 5,000 amounts to 50% of its income from operation. And obviously, if we include that, um, it would definitely affect the amount that was material in this case. Okay, faithful representation and related ingredients of this fundamental quality are completeness, neutrality, and free from error. So what is completeness? All information that is necessary for faithful representation is provided. Neutrality means that the company cannot select information to favor one set of interested parties over another. And free from error, I think, is pretty straightforward here. That's information that doesn't have errors in it. It's an accurate representation of the financials. All right, enhancing qualities. Um, here, in, at the enhancing qualitative characteristics are complementary to the qualitative characteristics. And here, we talked about some of these here. And now we can take a look at those enhancing qualities of comparability, verifiability, timeliness, and understandability. And here, you'll want to read these carefully as you're doing your studying. But one new term here I want you to see is comprehensive income. Comprehensive income is the change in net assets of an entity during a period from the transactions 
or other events and circumstances from non-owner sources. It includes all changes in equity during a period except those resulting from investments by owners and distributions to owners. Okay, comprehensive income. Okay, I think you all know about revenues, expenses, gains, and losses. I won't go through those, but you may want to fine-tune your thinking by reading this in a little more depth. Okay, let's put some of this into practice. Here, a local broker calls you up about a tip. This tip is a company called A-Rod, and it sells sports memorabilia online. They are offering some bonds that mature in 15 years and promise a 10% yield. You tell the broker that before investing in this hot commodity, you'd like to see the financials, pretty logical request. The broker sends you the statements, which are from last year and unaudited. And the owner, Roderick Andrews, prepared those statements. You review the, the statements and they are quite impressive. They reported a profit of 3.5 million and showed a low debt to equity ratio. The statement provides no comparative amounts for prior years. There are no note disclosures as to how they did inventory depreciation, the liabilities, et cetera. So with a focus on relevance and faithful representation, um, determine if this would be a wise investment decision. Okay. Well, I think you could pretty well know that with respect to relevance, this information needs to be timely. It was not. Another element, predictive value, it's not relevant because it provides no reference to prior years. And feedback value is, a, is closely related to predictive value, and they don't provide any feedback. <laughs> uh, with respect to faithful representation, information must be verifiable by several independent parties, and these were not audited. Okay, so it's nice to think that maybe the 3.5 million was good and the debt to equity ratio was good, but you don't have reasonable assurance. The company lacks neutrality for that for that so i think you get the idea um the company owner is certainly not a dis disinterested third-party investor okay uh basic assumptions and principles of accounting here our assumptions are economic entity going concern monetary unit periodicity and I think you've had all these, so we'll go over this very quickly. The economic entity means that the economic ac activity can be identified with a particular unit of accountability. So that unit of accountability would be the company. Um, and then the going concern here has three significant implications. The historical cost principle is of limited usefulness because if we have to assume an eventual liquidation. Depreciation and amortization approaches may need to be adjusted because they're not accurate anymore. And the current and non-current classification of assets may lose their significance. Okay, and the monetary unit assumption, normally that means we're gonna be using dollars. And the periodicity uh, assumption or time period implies that we've divided our reporting periods into artificial time periods, usually months, but sometimes other periods. Okay, uh, principles of accounting. I think this is probably a good place for us to start, stop this video, number two. And when we come back, we'll take a look at principles of accounting. Until then, bye for now.